Congress and have I'm Mindy Dom. I'm the rep for the Third Hampshire District, which includes Amherst and half of the town of Granby. Um, I want to welcome everybody to today's legislative briefing on long COVID. I just have a couple of early remarks. I want to recognize the co-sponsors for today's briefing with deep gratitude, including Representative Marjorie Decker, who is the House Chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health and the Massachusetts Black and Latino Legislative Caucus. A little bit about logistics. Please introduce yourselves in the chat where you'll also find a schedule and the sequence of speakers. Please make sure, if you can, that you have your office's name in your Zoom name so that we know who you are. As you know, we will be recording the presentations today, but we won't be including the questions and answers. Um, several reps have expressed their interest in today's briefing, but given um, the busyness of the state house, we're unable to make it. And so we're hoping that the slide deck as well as the uh, video presentation will help people learn about long COVID. So why, why are we doing this? Why are we having a briefing on long COVID? We certainly don't speak enough about it. We often don't recognize its debilitating and disabling impact on so many. And the way that impact has created a pressing need for government to respond whether with community information and education, medical and social supports, acknowledgement, or research. A bill I filed, which we learned this week has advanced from committee, which is terrific, um, would create a commission to prioritize our state's response to the emerging needs of long COVID. Um, and I'm happy to share that there's also a lot of activity that's happening at the federal level. Today's briefing is designed to provide us with a comprehensive view of long COVID, centering the person who's living with it and hearing from researchers, healthcare providers, social workers, and public health officials. We will explore how long COVID affects different communities and why health equity is a necessary component of both our understanding and our response. Today's briefing is designed to answer three simple questions. What do we know about long COVID? What don't we know about long COVID? And what do we need to know? about long COVID. We're hoping that this is the first of a two-part series. The second part is scheduled for early March and will follow today's with what we can do about long COVID. Incredibly, this week marks the fourth anniversary of the federal declaration of the COVID-19 public health emergency. The date for part two will coincide with the state declaration. There is a case to be made that science's lack of clarity on long COVID should not prevent us from doing all what we can, not only to seek that clarity, but to respond to needs resulting from the lack of it, including the need to acknowledge its very existence. Some of you may have constituents, friends, family members living with long COVID or suffering from its effects. They've reached out to your office or to you personally seeking health care information on referrals for public health support. We really hope that today's presentation shares what we know about long COVID and gives us information on how we can support people living with it and expands our understanding of the role health equity needs to play in responding to it. I wanna thank our speakers for participating in today's briefing and all that they do to support individuals and in our community. They are the champions and pioneers. Today, we don't know much about long COVID, but we do know what people are experiencing, how that experience is reflected through a health equity lens and what their individual and collective needs are as a result. We know that knowledge will evolve, but that does not excuse inaction today. Thanks to the advocates and a special nod to Jackie Lindsay, who has been so helpful in developing today's program. And th special thanks also to Lily Stowe Alekman, my staff director, for being the lead on today's briefing, for her extraordinary skills, patience, and integrity. At today's briefing, each speaker will present from their vantage point, whether they are a person living with it, a healthcare provider offering treatment, the researcher examining its impact, and the public health official addressing it. It will be followed by a Q&A session. And like I said earlier, please feel free to hold your questions till the end, 
or put them in the chat as you think of them. We'll also make the slide deck available. So we're going to begin and we're gonna start with Dr. Cheryl Clark from the perspective of a clinician, medical provider and community-based researcher. Dr. Clark is the executive director and senior vice president of the Institute for Health Equity Research Evaluation and Policy with the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. She's also an associate chief at the Division of General Internal Medicine and Primary Care at Brigham and Women's Hospital and associate professor at Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Dr. Clark. Clark. Thank you so much. Um, and I also want to thank you, uh, Representative Dom, for uh, hosting us and for shining a light on this important condition. Want to thank uh, also the uh, Lily uh, for all of your um, support and leadership in putting this briefing together, and the uh, the co-sponsors of this event. Uh, we may have a slide that gives us the uh, oh yeah here we are that gives us the title. Um, and so I'll just sort of wait till we get that up and running. See. Is this the slide? Yes, this is perfect. And so this is, uh, as uh, Representative Dom said, part one, uh, long COVID and health equity in the Commonwealth, what we know and what we don't know. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Just uh, for me personally, I have no uh, conflicts of interest to declare and you see my um, affiliations, um, and they're available, I think, in the biography. And I'm representing uh, myself today as an investigator uh, and researcher for the Boston Recover Study. And also on the next slide, um, as a member of the Boston, uh, uh, the Boston uh, Recovery Cohort, the Community uh, Partnership Table. And uh, this is um, a part of the National Institutes of Health uh, recover study uh, that was funded to try to understand uh, what is long COVID and what are its effects. Um, six hospital systems within Boston came together to perform that study. But as a part of that, uh, several of us who have our uh, expertise in community engagement uh, and community uh, partnership and leadership understood that much of what needs to be done around uh, long COVID is making sure we build that partnership. And out of that work, the community partnership table was born and uh, aptly and um, uh, fantastically led by Jackie Lindsay. And you will uh, meet uh, Jackie Lindsay, who is uh, president of Innovation by Design in the March session. And the mission of the uh, community partnership table is to center community and social justice to attain equity in uh, recovery from long COVID. And that has four key missions that um, community organizations and partners identified. So first is research, making sure that as the recover study understood its lessons that uh, the conclusions that are drawn from the study come from diverse representation in research. Community education, which is bi-directional, making sure that all of us understand what long COVID is and that we think about the equity issues around them, but also that we understand from community perspective what that experience is like. Making sure that community members who are experiencing long COVID get the clinical care and social support connections that they need and also institutional uh, change and policy change so that we in healthcare settings, we as advocates uh, for our communities uh, have the resources that we need to improve health. So that is uh, the context of our briefing today. I will, on the next slide, uh, just um, introduce a little bit of, on the topic of what long COVID actually is. And you'll hear some of similar themes throughout the briefing. On the next slide, um, I want you to keep your um, eye on the fact that long COVID is um, an important condition for us to understand if, in no part because it is so common. Uh, 23 million people across the United States are affected and it has an impact on our economy. It's estimated that about a million people are out of work uh, because of the debilitating symptoms, which we'll talk about. There are data from the Massachusetts Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey that show that roughly up to about 20% of people who've ever tested positive say that they have some symptom of long COVID 
And so this is absolutely an important thing for us to keep our eye on. On the next slide, I want you to also uh, have in mind uh, the uh, the information uh, and also the sources so that you can uh, keep abreast of this evolving story. Uh, the Social Security Administration tasked the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Engineering and Medicine with coming up with a definition of long COVID. And so what you'll see is the working definition so far that long COVID is a viral syndrome and it's defined by its signs, symptoms and conditions that either continue or that develop after an initial infection with uh, COVID and the formal name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2. I want you to know the three sort of uh, elements so far that we think about. So one is the timing. It's four weeks or more after you were first infected with the virus. It's involvement. You'll hear this term multi-system. It affects so many different parts of the body, right? And progression. It can uh, relapse or remit or progress, which means it can kind of come, go away for a while, get better, or it could just continually worsen. So it definitely has a, uh, a bunch of ways in which we experience the disease. It is also uh, important to think about its severity. Uh, symptoms of long COVID can be severe and life-threatening, even months after the initial or years after the initial infection. And it's also very complex. It's not really one condition, um, it's multiple conditions. And so on the next slide, we'll talk about that. I wanted you to have a sense of the uh, demographics in Massachusetts. And what I would say is that uh, there are differences in the ways that surveys are performed. So we see slightly different numbers um, with um, in Massachusetts and we'll see nationally. And you see that there are differences by race and ethnicity where um, Hispanic or people who identify as being Hispanic, Latino, or Latine are um, very likely to have COVID. About 24% of those who uh, have a positive test um, were also found to be positive and uh, have positive symptoms uh, in BRFSS data. Um, you see that there is an income gradient where those who make uh, more than $100,000 or so a year tend to have less uh, symptomatology or, or less likely to say that they have symptoms. You see that there are relationships uh, by uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as by uh, disability identity, uh, where those who previously identified having a disability uh, were more likely than those who do not to have had uh, symptoms of long COVID. On the next slide, you'll see that those numbers um, nationally in the United States um, around 6.9% uh, or so, um, where there are differences uh, by uh, race and ethnicity, um, where you also see uh, Hispanic populations, those who identify as Latina or Latino, Latina, um, have uh, a higher proportion, and that you don't see the same uh, sort of dimensions or along the lines of uh, income. What I would say is that uh, Part of what we need to understand is that there are varying definitions of long COVID, and that may, and there are also varying levels of access to care to even have someone interpret your symptoms for you. And so that may also account for some of the differences that we see. On the next slide, um, what I would point out uh, is that uh, COVID, we said it was multi-system. It gets in the body and affects health in so many ways. It attacks organs directly, including the lungs, the heart, the brain. And it also has several underlying biological uh, processes like blood clotting. It affects um, the way that our immune system functions. And you'll hear about that in more detail um, from uh, other presenters. On the next slide, we also wanted you, uh, let's see, to be aware, and I remember which was the next, yeah, there we are, that the health effects of long COVID also vary depending on how you ask the question and who you ask the question of. Uh, the symptoms can include anything. So there is a study I wanted you to know about in New York that showed that there may be differences either culturally or otherwise in how some groups report their symptoms or what they experience. So headaches, um, blood clotting, like kind of high risk threatening conditions are often seen in some populations that identify as being black or Hispanic compared to other groups. And in the RECOVER study itself, uh, we see differences in terms of uh, just the um, symptoms, including brain fog, 
uh, tends to be very common in the recover study. So we have a lot uh, to know to try to understand how uh, long COVID shows up in different populations. The uh, next slide, I also wanted to uh, mention that part of what we need to understand is that because COVID and long COVID is a multi-system disease, we do need to make sure that people have adequate access to primary care to help to coordinate and to manage all of these multiple systems in addition to the specialty care for specific symptoms. And unfortunately, the context of long COVID is happening while we're seeing a decline in primary care capacity. Uh, what I would say is that um, there are several uh, resources that you can uh, look to, including the Massachusetts Health Quality Partners in CHIA has a recent study that shows us what that decline looked like uh, during uh, the COVID period that we still are grappling with. And on the next slide, um, I also want to make sure that we understand that in addition to the biology, COVID is deeply social. The grief and the loss that's experienced, the socioeconomic insecurity, housing insecurity that people are experiencing, in addition to the decreased access to care is also something that we need to uh, be aware of. So on the next slide, I wanted to uh, just show you uh, some information from the US Census, which conducts uh, household pulse surveys. And the most recent at the end of October uh, really emphasizes that we need to keep both the social as well as the biology and multi-sector approaches to address long COVID. People are still really grappling with being able to pay for their usual household expenses. And we see that that also differs uh, by ethnicity and race. So on the last slide, I want you to take away at least four points. Um, and so we can go ahead and uh, just kind of click through those. Um, one is um, remembering that the impact of long COVID is biological and social. And that as we get a better sense of how to define it, we do need to track its impact in Massachusetts. So we know what kind of long COVID that we have uh, locally. What are those symptoms in the populations that we care about? We need the data to know that. We also need to make sure that we think through primary care capacity that's needed to manage this chronic disease with a lot of moving parts, and that we also need to address the context of care, structural inequities. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share this information. That was fabulous and has left me with many questions. So I'm looking forward to the rest of the speakers and then seeing what emerges in the question and answer. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Park, for your work and also just for your real clarity in presenting to us what we know and what we don't know and reminding us that um, health is social. It's not something that's separate. We might wanna silo everything, but we really can't. Thank you. Our next speaker is um, a good friend, a Western Massachusetts person, but also um, a public health expert. Estevan Garcia is currently the chief medical officer of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Those of us in Western Mass know him because he was one of our stars during the beginning of the COVID pandemic and making sure that people had access to care. Um, and he will offer his perspective as a public health official. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for joining us. Thank you uh, for the invitation, uh, uh, Representative Dom, and your staff for um, organizing this. I think it's a very important uh, topic as we move forward. Um, and um, the Department of Public Health clearly has a role uh, and a role that um, will, will likely expand as more information becomes available. Um, next slide. So I thought we'd just touch on a few topics and you're gonna notice that there's quite a bit of overlap um, from the, the speakers because we each are approaching the um, uh, uh, long COVID from a, a bit of a different perspective, but um, quite a bit of overlap. Um, so we'll talk about other names because um, it can be confusing as to, and, and one of our, our our goals is to make sure that we we um, uh, try to try to be honest with that and um, understand um, the the definitions as well as um, to touch on what we know um, I think it's important many constituents would want to know you know who can get long covid um, and also uh, just really begin to touch on some of the mechanisms which is new research um, but certainly important and then um, as a department of public health we certainly are um, advocates for vaccination and treatment um, and have uh, uh, done a significant uh, work with uh, at the state to get folks vaccinated. And we want to touch on how that's impacting long COVID as well. Next slide. 
Um, so when we talked a little bit about uh, the, the idea of what are, what, are, what are other names also known as um, long COVID, so post-COVID conditions or long haul COVID, uh, post-acute COVID-19, long-term effects of COVID, uh, chronic COVID. So these are all um, uh, definitions or uh, sorry, these are all names of the same uh, condition. Um, and so um, we are using long COVID. Um, next slide. Uh, during this talk, and I think it's it's probably the most accepted term, though there are other terms with a slightly different definitions, um, which does impact um, the um, assessment of how many folks um, have uh, long COVID. So um, the CDC definition um, it, it, we, we're using here is long COVID, um, and it is a patient-created term. Um, it, and as was already discussed, looking at the time frame, four weeks or more. Um, obviously, um, we we talked a little bit about the importance of understanding that this is one. It's not one condition; it's a multitude of conditions, and that multi-systemic um, uh, involvement, which means lots of body systems, can be involved. And the idea that it is relapsing and remitting, it can get worse over time, can be life threatening. Um, and this definition, as was mentioned uh, by uh, Dr. Clark, um, continues to be revised um, and, and is, is kind of in an iterative manner as more information becomes available. So while we've been um, uh, dealing with COVID as a society for quite some time, um, the definition has continued to um, uh, progress over time, really driven by patients. Next slide. So yeah, I thought we touched just briefly on what we know. And again, based on the definition that we're using up to 10%, um, uh, but certainly um, depending on the definition that can run from less than 10% to more than 30% um, of individuals with acute respiratory uh, um, syn uh, syndrome of COVID, um, of SARS-CoV-2 um, can certainly uh, uh, um, have long COVID. Um, the, the disease is so 65 million individuals worldwide, again, can be much higher depending on the, de the definition used, um, but the disease burden is from mild to debilitating, and I think that's also important for us uh, in the in the healthcare prof uh, profession not to assume a mild case is not long COVID. It certainly can be. Um, more than 200 symptoms have been identified, and that in and of itself is um, uh, very makes this this um, disease very complicated. This condition very complicated. The CDC tends to um, lump uh, um, um, some of these uh, conditions together, and the most common reported um, uh, symptoms are tiredness or fatigue, that you know malaise, some fever, difficulty breathing, so a respiratory component certainly, and then that brain fog that Dr. Clark mentioned, um, um, but including in that um, uh, dizziness, headache, and and sleeping difficulties, and then some GI stomach pain and diarrhea as well. So those are the most common reported symptoms, but again up to 200 symptoms have been reported. Um, when you think about um, how do we identify um, the, the signs of long COVID, so there are some x-ray or radiologic findings. Um, so when studies are done, CTs, MRIs, they're able to find evidence of, of damage and the olfactory uh, bulb, or that's how we smell, uh, as well as the brain, the heart, and the lungs. Um, and then, as was mentioned um, earlier, the microclots or this, this idea that there's a vascular component, um, this is also found um, in and indicates a hypercoagulable state um, or a way to build um, uh, um, clots within the um, within the body. So can be certainly concerning. Next slide. Um, and, and I thought I'd touch just briefly on you know the possible mechanisms. And this really is where the work is being done and needs to be done moving forward. Um, and you'll see more of this in, in the coming presentations. Um, but the, the, the idea here is that research is building on prior experience of this post-viral sequelae. Um, and so that means that you know after a virus, after a viral infection, um, and there are a couple of other related conditions to that, including things like um, uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome, seem to have related uh, um, uh, pathways potentially uh, that researchers are looking at. In addition to that, there are some uh, viral infections specifically that can offer informative pathways to the uh, COVID, uh, long COVID. Um, and those include EBV, the measles virus, as well as others. And finally, there's evidence of persistent viral infection in some individuals. So you're either seeing the virus or components of the virus um, in some patients um, that, that is also important in uh, the development of the possible mechanisms. Next slide. 
So who can get long COVID? I think this is a, a common question that is certainly something that we um, would want to uh, at least touch on. And, 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 you know, our perspective is that anyone infected with the virus is susceptible of, of uh, developing long COVID and can get long COVID. Um, it uh, occurs more commonly um, in people with severe disease, though mild disease can absolutely also have uh, uh, developed long COVID. Um, the idea that each time you are um, infected with the virus leads to um, uh, an, another chance of developing long COVID, so multiple infections. I myself have been infected three times um, uh, during during uh, the last uh, four years, um, and so certainly it, it is a, a concern even being even being vaccinated. Um, severe COVID, uh, uh, people at greatest risk, uh, the belief is that those with um, severe disease, hospitalized ICU uh, on types of um, concerns, certainly unvaccinated individuals, individuals with, with um, uh, health conditions that may uh, make them susceptible. And as was mentioned earlier, the health inequities that we see every day are, do impact our communities and um, develop and have a higher risk of developing long COVID for those communities. And, and really it's, it's, it's the ability to, uh, to obtain vaccinations, the ability to understand um, uh, how, to prevent, how to prevent illness. Um, uh, do you have access to primary care? Do you have access access to um, subspecialty care. These are all things that, um, that are part of the health inequities, um, even health insurance and other, other situations. Um, next slide. So um, one of the things I thought I'd touch on is just um, because I am a pediatrician and um, whether or not, you know, does long COVID affect um, uh, children? It certainly does affect children. The, the um, um, uh, concept is that it's a, a smaller percentage or a lower number than potentially um, uh, adults. Um, a recent study looked at uh, vaccinating children and whether or not it was protective against long COVID. Um, the Academy of Pediatrics highlighted this study um, and up to 35% of uh, um, uh, children uh, it, it was effective in preventing long COVID for up to a year. Now, the interesting thing about this study is that it looked at, um, the, the belief is here that it protected children because um, from long COVID because it protected them from getting COVID to begin with. So that was really the protective, um, the protective effect. Um, and certainly in adults and others can speak to this, but multiple studies have supported um, the protective effects of vaccines. The one other area that I thought we'd just touch on, and I know there's so much research that needs to be done on treatment of COVID and then the treatment impact um, on uh, um, um, developing long COVID. And so there was a recent study evaluating Paxlovid in treatment um, uh, and did not find a significant protective effect. Um, that being said, um, it was important to understand that that was also kind of in a milder subset of groups, not severe cases, hospitalized individuals, but mild, uh, mild COVID. So clearly more work needs to be done here um, as well. Next slide. So I think it's important to understand how do we protect ourselves from long COVID because we we certainly see a significant number of individuals developing um, long COVID. It um, uh, negatively impacts their their day, uh, daily function um, and uh, and and their lives. Um, and we need to figure out how to how to not only treat that and I think that's where an opportunity is moving forward, but also how to prevent the infection. So avoiding COVID nineteen infections to begin with and avoiding reinfections. Every reinfection uh, potentially is another another opportunity to develop long COVID. Um, the, uh, you know, and I push basic infection prevention strategies at the department, um, you know, um, really the idea that not only do you want to stay home when you're sick because you're more susceptible to other infections, but you also, you know, potentially could spread infection. Um, uh, the surfaces, washing your hands and surfaces, masking um, when COVID-19 activity is high, I think is also um, a, a fair approach. Um, and testing and treatment when um, uh, I think is also uh, important in, in situations as well. Um, and the last thing I'd say is, um, I think from uh, next slide, from our perspective as Department of Public Health, we um, want to help um, uh, spread the, uh, the information that is available and serve as a, a kind of a landing uh, spot for folks that are interested. All of these um, uh, um, uh, links are available and they will be available on our website um, at the um, uh, really uh, support of um, Representative Dom. We're developing a, and most of this comes from our webpage that is being developed and we will link to those individuals that are most, uh, yes, it's coming. <laughs> um, and we'll link to those individuals uh, and individual um, uh, uh, researchers, as well as treatments that are available and treatment facilities that are available. The Department of Public Health has a role here and should um, continue to, uh, to support the work that's being done by the great researchers and those on this call as well. So thank you again, and uh, looking forward to the rest of the presentation.
Wow, Dr. Garcia, you really buried that lead there that you were coming in, <laughs> that um, DPH is working on a website. Thank you so much. That's great news. And I'm sure this uh, many of the panelists would be available to support that and provide you with other links and information. Thank you also for um, all the other information that you provided. And I'm grateful for your participation today. Um, I want to, before we move on, I just want to recognize the representatives who have come to attend the briefing in person. Um, they include Representatives Owens, Diggs, Howard, Representative Farley Bouvier, uh, Representative Gonzalez, and Senator Gomez. Thank you so much to my colleagues for joining us. And I also wanna recognize that Nora Bent, who is the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Caucus of Women Legislators is with us as well. And so that represents over 50 legislators. Um, and thank you again to the staff people who are with us. We're gonna move right along. Um, we Our next speaker is actually on the schedule twice because she'll also have an opportunity at the end of all the presentations just to give us her response to that. I'm very grateful that she's participating with us today and for the insight that she's provided in past presentations and how much I've learned from her presentations. I'd like to invite Nisha McRae um, to come forward to speak, to give, offer us a perspective from someone who's living with long COVID. Nisha is also the executive director of, and I may mispronounce this and my apologies, um, Embadika. And I'm looking forward to her presentation today. Welcome, Nisha. Thank you so much, Representative Dom, and thank you all for having me today. My name is Nisha McRae, and I am the proud founder and executive director of Bajika, which means idea. And we're a nonprofit organization focused on making STEM or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education accessible to everyone. One of the things that is my pride and joy is being able to share my knowledge that I've gained over the past decade and a half we've been operating in the greater Boston area with learners of all ages. Because one thing I've learned in my career is that it's great to understand science, tech, engineering, and math or STEM, but that's useless if you're not able to communicate that with other people. You just are the smartest person in the room, but no one else is able to enjoy that discovery process with you. And I find that resonates to the next chapter in my life that I want to discuss today in this hearing. So today I want to under, want you to understand the impacts of long COVID from a patient perspective. And usually a lot of my learners as well as my partners would say, oh, Nisha's talking at a hearing? She's this mysterious woman. She's not one who tells us about her private life or what's going on beyond what she wants you to know in her classroom or through her TV show. But because of the significance of long COVID in the Massachusetts community, I want to lift up the veil of what it's like to be someone in Massachusetts with long COVID. So on the next slide. When COVID hit, Nisha was perfectly healthy. She was living her dream, graduating from Boston's MIT in 2014, had her own nonprofit and was saving for a house with her partner. But after getting COVID in March of 2020, she was forced to put all of that on hold. Everyone who met me said, just give it a couple more weeks. The more they saw me slowly going downhill, everyone kind of switched to, you're developing some type of chronic condition. We don't know what it is. I'm terrified. I've been terrified for the past year. I've been especially terrified the last six months. Month after month, her COVID symptoms persisted. And then Nisha started developing new conditions. It feels like my brain is on fire, like it's being cooked on the daily. And last year, it was so intense that it was starting to cause me to have extremely violent involuntary body movements. The seizure disorder was getting to the point that I could count the number of hours I could be conscious and functional on one hand. Struggling to find treatment, appointments were limited and doctors were skeptical. But then cases like hers began being reported across the United States and the world. And I had one specialist who at first was like, no, like it's probably nothing, it'll improve in a couple of months, have to come to me and go, my nurse, my right hand woman, she had COVID a couple months ago, and everything I've seen with you, she's going through. 
Thank you. So next slide, please. That video was recorded by ABC in June of 2022. And what most of America saw when they saw that new segment, uh, over 100,000 and counting, was they saw someone who they felt was down and out and at their lowest point. And I had to personally respond to some comments on the YouTube video and say, what you saw in that video was one of my proudest moments in my life. Because between March 2020 until June of 2022, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to ever communicate with another human being verbally for the rest of my life. What you saw in the video was me having remitting long COVID symptoms. Between my COVID infection until that moment, I went from a fully functional, working 40 plus hours a week as executive director of a highly respected STEM organization to someone who was bed bound and had to be in a room with no light, no sound, and I couldn't talk for days on end or even help myself out of the bed in order to relieve myself and needed 24 seven care from my husband as well as my mother. At that time, I wasn't able to get access to a primary care physician for a virtual appointment, let alone in person. So me and my family and loved ones were left figuring out what can I do? And it took over a year and a half in order for me to even see a specialist who at first stated, it could be because you're turning 30, which to me was a shock because I've never known anyone to be bed bound for a year and a half because they were turning 30, but we kept moving forward. And I went from bed bound to someone who was able to return to part-time work in June, 2022, to fast forward to now, I'm able to return to full-time work and continue sharing my knowledge with learners of all ages in the greater Boston area. And so I want us to look at June, 2022. Could you go to the next slide, please? You see, my story isn't particularly unique in Massachusetts, let alone in the United States. In June of 2022, we had the National Center for Health Statistics and U.S. Census Bureau came out with this 20-minute online survey to evaluate the impact of COVID-19 in the United States. The survey that took place right when that news segment was recorded just asked a number of Americans, have you noticed any long-lasting symptoms since your COVID-19 infection? Simple, straight to the point. On the next slide, we see that they were starting to realize something was going on in American households because they noticed two in five Americans have reported a previous COVID-19 infection. And on the next slide, we'll notice that out of those two in five who reported a previous COVID-19 infection, one in five Americans started reporting long COVID symptoms that were lasting longer than three or more months, which was at the time the definition for a long COVID syndrome. On the next slide, if we were to aggregate that number, it's about one in 13 Americans at that time were living with long COVID, which meant if you worked in any workplace, the number of individuals you can see from your work desk, one out of those 13 individuals had long COVID symptoms based on the long COVID pre prevalence rate at that time. But let's fast forward to the future. And we noticed that the US Census Bureau and the National Center for Health Statistics started to ask deeper questions in order to dissect what long COVID looked like from the patient's perspective or in American households. Because if you have a one in 13 Americans stating they're having long lasting symptoms post COVID infection, what does that look like? So we see that in September of 2022, they expanded those questions to ask, does long COVID limit your ability to carry out daily activities? And then in spring of 2023, they asked a more specific question, which is how significant is the impact of long COVID on your daily activities? And what we discovered last spring, if we could go to the next slide, and then skip this one here, is that Due to the Omicron wave in late 2022 into 2023, we had about one in two U.S. adults now reporting a previous COVID-19 infection. Out of that one in two, slide, 
Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> one in 10 Americans were reporting long COVID symptoms, up from one in 13 Americans. Now, this is after vaccines. So what we're realizing is that long COVID is still a risk, even with a vaccinated and possibly boosted population. But because of those new questions in the household poll survey, on the next slide, we can start to dissect what actually is the daily experience for those Americans. And they discovered that four in five of those Americans were discovering significant or at least mild limitations in their activities. And what they meant by that, to give some context, if you are, say, go to your nine to five, pick up your kids and have family time, do you have to rearrange your schedule due to your long COVID symptoms? For example, if your friend wants to go out to a bar or to socialize at a cafe, do you have to cancel that because you have your responsibilities and have limited energy or ability to also have a social aspect to it? And if we dissect that further to the most severe cases on the next slide, we noticed that one in four of those who were reporting long COVID symptoms reported significant activity limitations. Those are individuals who couldn't do full-time work and had to do part-time work, or if they worked a full day at a job, they weren't able to have time from home life or a social life or their community responsibilities. And so if we go to the next slide, that brings us to the bigger issue at play from the patient's perspective. It's not just the medical diagnosis and the ailment and the symptoms that we deal with as patients. It is also the impact, as Dr. Clark mentioned, to our social lives, our education levels, our occupation, and our income. That is what I've noticed from long COVID patients throughout the state of Massachusetts has impacted them the most. I'll end this here. When I first got my long COVID infection, the number one thing my doctors were telling me was to be patient and to allow time to pass in order to figure out my condition. But I knew something that has come to fruition and that's no one notices you suffering alone in your home until they realize when they step into their community that a face is missing, a service that they've relied on is missing or a good is no longer available. And my doctor didn't understand what I meant by the, that time and I said, you're drinking a Starbucks cup, which I know is a sin in Massachusetts due to Duncan's prevalence here. And I said, I don't think you will understand that if I'm going through this, a number of people here are going through this until you try to order your cup of coffee and it's not the way it used to be. And you'll understand the community impact of this ailment. So I'd like to thank you all for listening to the patient's perspective. And I want you to keep in mind, it's not just about the medical access and inequalities in the systems in Massachusetts. It's what the patient is actually going through right now in terms of their socioeconomic crisis and this need for safety nets and support in this state. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Nisha. I am uh, so powerful really about not just the reminder of what's involved, but when people know somebody, even if it's the barista at the Starbucks that's impacted, it makes a difference. And so I so appreciate you coming out into the community as a person who's living with long COVID and being able to educate us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, and you'll be back, so don't go away. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Gay to give us the perspective from a clinician and medical provider. Dr. Gay is the director of the COVID Recovery Center and an associate professor of medicine. Welcome, Dr. Gay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's really an honor to be here with these speakers today. It's uh, a great group, and it's, it's heartening to see the interest in long COVID. Um, you can go to the first slide, please. Uh, so I am first started thinking about a post-COVID clinic when I was working in the ICU in 2020. And with one of my fellows, um, we thought, wow, there's so many people going through these incredibly difficult ICU stays, they're going to need care afterwards. Um, this is a, just an example of a man I've known now since 2020 who had a really kind of horrible case of COVID with lung failure and developed liver failure, um, heart complications, kidney complications. And required a ton of rehab. Um, and he's kind of slowly done better, but it's taken years really to get back to where he was before he got sick. And so COVID was just incredibly devastating in the acute phase. I will say when we first 
started thinking about our clinic, we had no idea that long COVID was going to be a thing. And so long COVID was a complete surprise um, and has really sort of changed the way we thought about our clinic. Um, but from the beginning, we recognized that the patients we were seeing in the ICU were really um, patients um, often from historically disadvantaged communities, people who could not isolate, um, put people in public facing occupations. Um, I felt like in the spring of 2020, it was much more dangerous to be a tea worker than to be a physician. Um, and so we really wanted to think about um, building our clinic with a focus on making sure that everyone could have access to it from the community. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so um, I think Dr. Garcia um, mentioned this, but uh, COVID, long COVID is a very interesting disease because it really has been built um, kind of starting with patients' experiences. And so that we understand way more now about what people feel than we truly understand about the mechanisms of disease. Um, but I think that's also a powerful part of understanding long COVID is that patients have had a seat at the table from the very beginning of trying to understand this disease and play such an important role in how we think about research and how we think about really trying to help people feel better. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and again, I, I think Dr. Garcia also mentioned a little bit about pathophysiology. So I just wanted to highlight um, one aspect that we've seen a lot of in our clinic. And so, um, you know, I'm a lung doctor, so we see a lot of people with shortness of breath. And what we sometimes find is that patients have just dis uh, disabling shortness of breath and fatigue, but they have relatively normal testing. So your heart looks fine, your lungs look fine. And I think patients are often told, well, we can't really find anything wrong with you. And what we found is that a lot of patients have problems with a part of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. Um, and that's a part that usually does things that we don't have to think about, like regulation of heart rate, kind of coordinating the response to exercise. Um, and so for um, a lot of those patients, if you end up doing more um, kind of uh, detailed testing of the nervous system or more detailed exercise testing, you can diagnose that problem. But it can take a long time to get to that diagnosis. It's not common. The testing needed is not available everywhere. Um, but that can lead us to treatment. Um, but just an example of, I think, how long COVID can be very frustrating for patients because it, it may not be apparent right away um, what's leading to symptoms that to many doctors seem kind of out of proportion to relatively normal testing. And so um, I think that experience shapes a lot of um, the delays in diagnosis of some aspects of long COVID that may be treatable. And so that's the sort of one aspect of pathophysiology that's becoming more clear. And then as, as people have talked about, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand what event, what are risk factors for long COVID and to understand if they're disease modifying treatments that we could start early on. Um, very interesting science, basic science work on this, but it's not yet sort of translating into clinical practice. Next slide, please. Um, and so just to just to point out, so the model, the probably the best way to take care of long COVID patients is to have a multidisciplinary clinic where you have you have the patient and you bring specialists as needed, and the care is coordinated, and you offer support for mental health, for physical therapy. But that's not really how our healthcare system is designed to work. And so the way we work is people are often shuttled to different specialists. Um, the primary care doctor may not be in the same system as the specialist. And so patients can be left sort of trying to make their own way um, and try to figure out for themselves um, how to find a way to feel better. Um, and so, you know, the, the model that we try to create in our clinic is, is this model, but it, that is not a common model of care um, for most of the United States um, for many reasons. Next slide, please. Um, and this has been pointed out now by, by I think, all our speakers, but it, this is really um, kind of important, not just to the individual patient, but a major public health issue. Um, there are also, I think, things about COVID that we don't understand yet. And so uh, hopefully many people can return to work, but not everyone can. Uh, or people may be out of work for a long time um, in ways that sort of impact their personal lives, but also their communities. Next slide, please. Um, and I just want to say a word about mental health. So uh, clearly, um, mental health concerns 
um, were worsened by the pandemic. And so a lot of this data is a little hard to interpret because they couldn't control for this pandemic, but people with long COVID do report more mental health diagnoses and certainly more symptoms. Um, and of course, this puts a strain on a system where we already lack for easy access to mental health care providers, um, to physicians, but also to therapists and counselors. Next slide, please. And so I want to spend a few minutes just talking about equity concerns because that had been so important to us when we designed our clinic. And um, of course, acute COVID and now long COVID um, has had a disproportionate effect on um, historically underrepresented communities for very complex, I think, social reasons. Um, but that means that the burden of long COVID is also potentially something that may impact these communities more than uh, communities that have better access to subspecialized care. Next slide, please. So I'm just briefly uh, show you some data from our clinic. This is an analysis of our first 1,200 patients that we saw. Um, and this was using a, a kind of agnostic statistical program through help um, from Dr. Matt Mole, one of my colleagues, um, and basically divided patients into uh, cohorts, uh, looking at sex, race, insurance, um, ICU stay. And so I want to point out two things. One is about 90% of the patients who we saw in our clinic were white and, and commercially insured. And that we know does not reflect the burden of long COVID in the community. Um, so I think this sort of shows us that we have a problem with providing access to our COVID recovery center to everyone, which we worried we would. And we this is, and I will say this is despite attempts to do community outreach and to make um, it more, um, to make it easier for people to be referred to our clinic from all communities. So this is despite being intentional about it, we still see this disparity in what we know is going on in the community and the patients that we see. And then if you look at the patients we see, we found that there were three different cohorts, um, a group that was more identified, uh, used more interpreter services, more likely to identify as Latinx, a, group, a cohort two, um, who mostly white and had commercial insurance, and then a cohort three who were more likely to be black um, and have commercial insurances but not use interpreters. Both cohorts one and three had more, um, had, had more ICU stays, so had more severe illness. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so what we found is that um, there were differences in how people were accessing service in that patients in clusters um, one and three who had more ICU stays um, weren't necessarily um, getting the same access to care coordination. Um, of note in cluster three, which, where we had more black patients, patients reported um, symptoms a little bit differently. And so some people complained of fewer symptoms. And I think, what this suggests, and of course it's a preliminary observation, is that there may be differences in how people report symptoms. And I, I think, um, so I have a clinic at Brigham, I have a clinic in Dorchester at Evans Corner, and then I go out to the Indian Health Service, um, to the Navajo Nation once a year. And so I've seen long COVID patients in all these areas. And I don't think long COVID is a different disease in these different spaces, but I think people's expectations of what they will tell their doctor and what they trust the doctor to do for them are different. And so I, I worry there may also be disparity in, you know, how people tell us about symptoms. Um, there's also a practical concern is that you have to be able to take time off work to come to this, our clinic. And so maybe if you have fatigue, you're, you're not going to seek care for that. If that means they have to take time off work or get child care. And so we may be seeing um, disparities in access to long COVID care um, despite our best intentions. Um, next slide, please. Um, and just a wrap up here. So I think um, also a number of speakers have pointed this out, but there's a lot of good research going on. I think we're really lucky to be in the environment here in Massachusetts where this is supported. Um, and next slide, please. And then just to um, kind of state this one more time, but COVID really has exposed, I think both acute COVID and long COVID point out to us all of the underlying systemic issues, um, not just in healthcare, but in um, kind of uh, our 
economic and societal structures. And so shortage of primary care and mental health services, um, lack of access to subspecialty care in more rural communities, um, the racial and ethnic disparities in care that we've mentioned. And then that our healthcare system doesn't sort of prioritize a whole patient-centered approach, but may uh, instead reward sort of a lot of testing, but without a sort of a comprehensive care plan for an individual patient. Um, and that's all, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gay. I and mean, that's um, so many wonderful points. And if I can just underscore one thing that you said towards the end that I think um, is a good reminder for us is that the potential disparities that exist in access to care end up sort of skewing what we see and observe as what people are experiencing. And that kind of shapes our understanding of what's going on, which can be very limited. So I really appreciate you pointing that out, that there may be disparities in access to care because that does lead to potential other sorts of um, factors that happen in results. Thank you. Our next speaker is a leader in the Boston area who's doing health equity research in long COVID. And that's Dr. Linda Sprague Martinez. And hold on one second, I'm going to, she is the professor in the Department of Medicine and the director of the Health Disparities Institute at UConn Health. Um, she's going to provide us with some perspectives from as a health equity researcher from her community-based research. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Sprague Martinez. Great. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'll point out that this research um, I conducted when I was with my previous institution, where I still hold an affiliation, the Boston University School of Social Work, in case you're wondering why a Connecticut researcher is here doing work in Boston, um, that well, in Massachusetts, but I still am a Massachusetts resident. So um, you can click to the next slide. I'm gonna talk about the impact of long COVID on diverse Black and Latinx communities in Massachusetts. And I really just wanna recognize a team um, of people that worked on this project with me, um, many of who are here today. Um, but we started this work back in uh, March of 20 or February 2022. We're funded by the Massachusetts Consortium on Pathogen uh, Readiness at Harvard Medical School. Um, and so you can click to the next slide. So our group, we were the Mass CPR Health Equity Corps, and just a little bit about our scope. Um, we started, we had a small project to really think about exploring the impact of long COVID on diverse um, Massachusetts communities to increase awareness of long COVID and then eventually to influence policies. Our initial scope, um, given the, our limitations, were to really focus on diverse Black and Latinx communities, and, but knowing that there are there's more of a focus needed um, across um, the state in new immigrant communities. You can click to the next slide. So we started out the long COVID assessment. I, I, I included this slide just because to put a picture of our state. In March of um, 2022, we looked at um, where the long COVID clinics were, what resources were available for people with long COVID as a starting point. Um, we had initially identified um, long COVID clinics located in Boston. We thought we found one that was out in Concord as well, but it ended up being a rehabilitation clinic. So when you look at this map from March of 22, um, it's the cases, um, the case intensity. So the darker the color, the more cases in that particular week. And then we overlaid um, where the clinics are. The dots are rehabilitation centers, um, and then the crosses were um, were long COVID clinics. Um, so you can see that all of the long COVID clinics in the state are concentrated in Boston, despite the fact that the state overall is highly impacted by long COVID, you can, um, by COVID-19 and then long COVID as well. So you can click to the next slide. Um, we did key informant interviews, which maybe another time I can tell you about our uh, informant interviews with um, clinics. Today, I'm going to focus in well, hone in on our focus groups we did to expo explore the impact of long COVID on diverse Black and Latinx communities. You can click to the next slide. Um, our goal was to conduct focus groups in English, Spanish, um, Haitian Creole, Portuguese, and Cape Verdean Creole. Um, we used uh, availability sampling. We part we were partnering with um, ASG, Archipelago Strategies Group. Um, they helped us um, gain media spots, as well as with focus group facilitation and outreach. Um, we went on uh, multilingual media outlets talking about prolonged um, 
prolonged COVID symptoms. Um, and we also then we conducted Zoom based focus groups that were recorded and transcribed. Um, and then we translated the uh, data back into English um, for non English speaking groups that were conducted. We manage all of our data in in vivo. Um, I can talk more about the methods later if people are interested, but I want to get to our findings. You can click double click. So in terms of, oh, you can go back. Um, in terms of our patient, uh, our participant demographics, we sp we ended up speaking with 99 participants from across the state. Um, you can see on this map where folks were. We did 11 groups. Um, two were in English with residents who identified as Black. Two were um, in Haitian Creole. One was in Portuguese and six were in Spanish. Um, overall, 30 of our participants identified as Black. Um, 69 identified as Latinx or more than one race. Um, if you click to the next slide. These are the symptoms. When we went across all of the groups, um, we were able to extract the symptoms that people were describing. Could They're consistent with what we heard from um, the experts uh, that spoke earlier. Um, you can click to the next slide. Um, one of the things that stuck out for us in the focus groups was just awareness of long COVID as a diagnosis. So it's not that people didn't know they were experiencing symptoms, but they didn't know that long COVID was a diagnosis. In nine of the 11 groups, the majority of participants had not heard of the term um, long, long COVID. COVID, but appreciated having language to describe what they were experiencing. And my data is a lot of quotes, and so I won't read them all in detail. I'll, I'll just share with um, pieces of them. This was a quote from, from a group where people talked about having heard of long COVID at a UCB, that's a Union Capital Boston table talk, um, where they brought in a physician and uh, from the Recover study, then they had done um, a discussion around long COVID. And this was a, a common piece that folks had talked about um, not at being relieved to hear that there was there was actually a term for long COVID um, and describing um, that described the symptoms that they had that were kind of lingering. Um, you can click to the next slide. Um, and this was just in the two English groups, people talked about that they had heard the term before, but they didn't feel like it was part of the mainstream discourse. They felt that um, it, and that people didn't talk about it also because of the stigma around the, around COVID. So to talk about prolonged COVID, um, they felt like it was more stigmatized and, and um, people weren't discussing it. So you can click to the next slide. So some of the impacts we heard, um, and this will echo what we've heard from previous speakers, but this is this idea that I'm struggling. I'm experiencing shortness of breath after COVID, headaches, um, it's like, it's like I'm struggling to get out of the house. It's been taxing. Um, it's been a lot, honestly. I just don't have the stamina, the energy in the morning. Um, this was a common theme that we heard from folks. The idea that their brain was foggy, it was coming and going. Some days were better than others. Um, and, and just saying I should have been documenting this stuff um, because they, they didn't, that it was going on. So in retrospect, they talked about maybe I should have documented better what I was experiencing. You can click to the next slide. Um, people talked about feeling bad every day. Um, they taught this um, particular um, individual in the group shared that um, they had been ongoing for a year, body pain, muscle pain, dizziness, vomiting, headaches, sinus symptoms never went away. Every symptom, they they felt like they've had it. And, and this was a theme we heard across groups of people feeling like they were crazy. They were feeling like something's going on. They feel bad, but their friends don't believe them. Their relatives don't believe them. And this is just not knowing that there's a, there's a diagnosis for what they're experiencing. You can click to the next slide. Um, people talked about it just being harder um, and the fatigue was this huge factor. Um, they're not able to sleep. They can't feel rested or gain rest. Everything was feeling harder and harder for them. Just the act of brushing their teeth or doing laundry um, and, and not, not knowing um, what was happening with them and, and when it was going to go away. So you can click to the next slide. Um, and we asked about healthcare, and you know, are you are you accessing care for your symptoms? Um, and this was a common theme we heard that MDs really don't care. I had the same thing with my primary care, and this was saying the same thing. Someone else in the group was talking about a similar theme, and she told them everything that was going they were go she was going through, and then just got nothing. You can click to the next slide. Um, and then this person's just saying, I honestly don't, I don't go anymore. I've given up. Honestly, I don't go anymore. I've been once or twice, um, 
like once in urgent care, another time to my primary care, but they really couldn't do anything for me. They talked about the long COVID clinic at the hospital um, and, and that was it. Um, they can give you resources. They don't know themselves what's happening. It's new to everyone. And this is where organizations need to take into consideration. How do we do better? And so there was a sense among participants in groups that they're going to the hospital, um, but they're not really getting what they need. And in some cases, they were being dismissed um, entirely. Um, and then they talked also about the challenges of going because you miss a day, but then they just refer you for more tests, um, but they're not really able to address any of your symptoms. So you can click to the next slide. Um, we also heard a lot about the social aspects, which was previously discussed. Um, we heard about lack of affordable care, medical debt accumulating as a result of, of going in for testing. Not having sick days was a really big theme. A lot of the people we spoke to didn't have sick days um, with their jobs or um, positions. And so when they missed a day, they missed a day of pay. They said that previously during the um, Pan during the pandemic, they were able to take time off for uh, for um, symptoms or not feeling well, but if they had COVID, but for long COVID, they, they couldn't take time off. And they noted that even for COVID, people don't always take time off because there's not pay for it. They talked about the challenges with disabilities, the shame of unemployment, job loss. Um, and then this idea that medical leave, even if you get it, it only covers a percent of your salary, but you still have to pay 100% of your bills eviction. So you can click to the next slide. I can share with you a couple of quotes. Um, this was a person who talked about their car, situation with their cars. Um, they had had two cars. They had to sell one. Um, they were getting help with wrench, which then stopped. Um, they didn't recover. They haven't recovered. Um, this was financially to the point where they were able to get a second car again. Um, they had to sell it. Um, and then they were left with one car again. So they really haven't been able to get back on their feet or completely situated. Um, as a result of long COVID, so you can click. Um, this was a, a woman who was talking about her sister's case. She was concerned that her sister was gonna lose her home um, because of her long COVID symptoms and her inability to get back to work. But she also talked about the challenges of taking care of her children with um, long COVID and how that was impacting her. Um, you can click to the next slide. This was, um, this was a person just describing the the overall having long COVID and its impact on people economically, socially, and psychologically. Um, you can click to the next slide. And this was this um, a common theme in groups when people um, who had a diagnosis with long COVID and they were able to you know they to get for disability they found it an exhausting process. So going through the process, getting approved for disability, I went three months without getting paid. It was hard to fight for disability. I was slow. I didn't know what I was doing. All this paperwork, calling a doctor, doing this and doing that, and I'm trying to get better at the same time. I took a hit with three months of lost income. And if you can imagine the challenges of applying for support services when you have um, a fo foggy brain or uh, exhaustion, um, in general, when you're well, it's challenging. So you can click to the next slide. This was um, just a, I wanted to share with you. We sent out to all of our participants a summary of what we found. We also sent out to nonprofit organizations across the state a summary of what we found um, so that overall, to, it's part of a strategy to increase awareness. Um, and we learned that a lot of people, in short, were experiencing long COVID, um, but that there wasn't a lot of resources. So I'm so excited about the website, hearing that the state's going to put out a website um, because part of this is just getting information about long COVID out to people so that they have those questions to ask the doctors. Um, and if you click to the next slide, um, this is an ad campaign that we developed. Oh, maybe it's, yeah. It's an ad campaign that we developed um, with our partners at ASG that is publicly available. We're happy to share it. We shared it with community partner organizations, but if the state's going to launch a website, um, these are ads that were based on the focus groups and they were vetted. We have them in multiple language, all the languages of the study, um, and we were happy to provide them to the, to the state as they develop the website. So thank you. Thank you, Linda, for all your work, for all your connection and linking us to resources and materials. Um, I just wanna add that it's hard enough to connect to social services when you're sick um, and when you're well. Um, and it's also hard to connect to services when they don't exist and you're still trying to figure out where are they and do they, are they there? We're gonna hear from Nisha one more time. 
in response to some of what's been discussed um, as a person living with long COVID. One of our big intentions with organizing today was to center the comments around that voice. <clears throat> so we want to give her the last word and then we'll open it up to some questions and answers. Nisha. Thank you once again, Representative Dom. And for those just joining us, my name is Nisha McCray. I'm the founder and executive director of Bajika, which is a nonprofit STEM or science, tech, engineering, and mathematics nonprofit organization that operates in Massachusetts. Um, next slide. So as I mentioned previously, one of my passions is being able to take the knowledge that I've had the privilege of gaining or that I've been able to discover and being able to work with my team in order to disseminate or communicate that to the general public so learners of all ages can engage with that knowledge. Because one of the things that I've noticed in my decade and a half career in STEM education is that Knowledge is great, but if people don't understand what you're actually doing and you're not able to communicate that, then we as a society cannot move forward. And so as I wrap up today's hearing in terms of my perspectives and what I've heard from all the wonderful experts who've taken their time to share their stories and perspectives on long COVID, I want to do a quick wrap up of what I want you all to take away from this hearing. Next slide, please. But the influx of patients is growing by the day, and the lack of treatment and resources is affecting American families. There are three bills sitting in Congress right now that would grant more funding for research and build more specialized clinics. A conservative estimate is 9 million people in America with long COVID. They want to get back to work. They want to be themselves. This is not in their heads. This is not something that it's just to get out of work or a disability scam. These patients just want to be themselves again. That makes sense. You guys got it? Okay. Without resources or treatment in sight, after years of fighting, Nisha had no choice but to push herself to go back to work. Okay, forgive me. Because just like so many others living with long COVID, all she wants is to be who she was before she got sick. And I just want to go somewhere that my family can breathe for the first time two plus years. Because right now, they've not been able to not stress about me. I just want them to be able to experience what was my career beforehand and them watching me twirl and teach and making science and engineering fun. And I want that moment back. Nine million people still suffering. Our thanks to Phil for bringing us that. But the influx of patients is growing. Oh, next slide, sorry. I wanted to highlight that because right now, this number's outdated. We're still looking for the new numbers is over 12.2 million Americans are currently out of work who were in the labor force pre-COVID or pre-COVID-19 infection. And we're looking at that as explaining about 15% of the labor shortage that we're experiencing at this time. And so remember when I stated that we won't experience or understand the impact of long COVID because it's such a lonely siloed experience that is in American households, but not really in the public. We don't understand the impact this has had on our community until we see those job postings not being fulfilled or that person at Starbucks or Dunkin' who used to fulfill our order perfectly not being there and us going back to building a new relationship with our morning routine. Next slide, please. And so I also want to give us the bigger picture here, and this is true across the nation and Massachusetts is no exception. The average number of Americans who have $1,000 in their bank account is less than 57% in terms of Americans who can have an emergency fund or cover, let's say, one month of lost income from a job because they had to take leave for, let's say, a COVID-19 infection and post-COVID-19 symptoms or complications. Next slide, please.
there's a new survey that was out regarding housing insecurity and long COVID. And the statement from that report I want to emphasize today is that the functional limitation in current long COVID symptoms impact day-to-day -day life and are associated with the higher prevalence of housing insecurity. Next slide. The average cost of a two-bedroom apartment in Boston is over $3,000 as of January 2024. And as you'll see on the next slide, given that number of about $3,000 for a two-bedroom and the 57% number of Americans who do not have $1,000 in emergency savings, if we look at the number of people who reported a previous COVID infection and are still reporting post-COVID complications that limit their daily activity. What are those individuals doing in order to fulfill their obligations to have shelter, food, and their basic needs met, let alone their new healthcare needs that are being brought on by their new long COVID reality? On the next slide, we know the answer already from those who were infected with COVID-19 and are suffering from long COVID pre-Omicron 2023. Two times are more likely to have difficulty with housing payments versus the typical American. And on the next slide, we also know that those individuals are facing higher housing insecurity and a higher risk of eviction or foreclosure. As Dr. Um, Martinez mentioned, there's a high number of individuals dealing with long COVID who are at risk of losing their housing. And with losing housing in the state of Massachusetts, as we know, means losing access to basic services, commercial health insurance, and supports and financial safety nets that are needed when you're dealing with multiple symptoms. Next slide, please. I would like to emphasize that it took me approximately 30 months in order to get a long COVID diagnosis. Now, again, that was because of the ICD-10 code had just been released. But for my doctors to look at my condition from, oh, she may have had a COVID-19 infection to she definitely had a COVID-19 infection, but we're not sure all these weird things happening with her are associated with long COVID to, oh, this is definitely associated with long COVID was 30 months. And the total cost right now, this is outdated because I haven't received my recent bills in the mail for my medical insurance and my support care is almost $500,000. If we take a step back, regardless of your socioeconomic status or your background, we'll be hard pressed to think this is a normal resource that individuals have. And yet I thank my community every day for making sure that I was able to stay alive be supported and have an opportunity to come from the abyss, which was me being bed bound with long COVID to being able to give back to my community again as a full-time STEM educator. That number also includes me having to seek care outside of the state of Massachusetts, because as I've mentioned previously, I couldn't even find a primary care doctor who was willing to see me in person, let alone virtually, despite having a primary care doctor when I had my COVID-19 infection and received my long COVID diagnosis later. Um, next two slides, please. And so at this time, I want us to reflect on the stories that we've heard. The last four years and counting, I've been able to go from the individual who's not able to take care of herself to someone who's now been able to realize her journey and share it with you all today. But one theme I keep hearing, whether it's the medical community, government offices, or in my own community, who may not even know what the heck long COVID is, as was stated by Dr. Martinez and Dr. Clark, is, oh, what can she do? What can Nisha do to get better? And it's never about, if we go to the next slide, why is she the only person responsible for her care? As a community of the state of Massachusetts, we are called the Commonwealth. And common meaning the root word for community. So why is it always about she and not what we can do? And the next slide, I'd like to say what I've done over the past two years is I've taken that burden myself, given what I've gone through, 
And I've decided to become a patient advocate in the long COVID community, whether that's helping with the Treat Long COVID Act with Representative Ayanna Presley, helping with different committees such as Recover or Mount Sinai's research group in order to figure out what ails long COVID patients, as well as being the executive director, sorry, the education director of C-19 Long Haulers Advocacy Project in order to try to help people understand what you're going through is real, long COVID does exist, its impact on your life is to the level of cancer, as we've heard from some medical professionals, and we need to support you. In closing, I would like to review that there are things we all can do. We can make sure everyone in our community understands what long COVID is, as Dr. Clark and Dr. Martinez has mentioned. We can look at what can we do within our organizations, our companies, and structures in order to make sure that we can evolve models of care to support patients holistically. And what I mean by that is the social, the economic, and the medical aspects of such a chronic ailment, as mentioned by Dr. Gay. And as Dr. Garcia mentioned, we can continue protecting ourselves and our community as we're dealing with high prevalence of COVID-19 by wearing a mask when those things happen, as well as making sure that we just don't ignore COVID-19 because we want to ignore the pandemic. There are so many parts of my story and millions of others that we can get into today. I can talk to you about trying to figure out blood clots, the severe cognitive dysfunction of not being able to do two plus two in front of little kindergartners and realizing there's something really wrong with your brain. And it's not just my brain's fuzzy or foggy. There's something actually going on or the seizures that seem to plague me every day of my existence. But what I want you to leave here with is that we are all members of a community. And when those are suffering in silence in their homes, it's not just about them, it's about us. And there's a quote from a comedian who I shall not name, which says, you never look at someone else's bowl to make sure you have more than them. You look in someone else's bowl to make sure they have enough. And if the pandemic has provided us an opportunity to do anything, it's for us, regardless of how we contribute to the Massachusetts community, to do just that, starting with long COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha, so much for your comments and your thoughtfulness and your activism. I want to thank all the speakers and attendees. I want to also remind folks that the next briefing on more information on what we can do is March 11th. And we're going to have a brief Q&A session. If you have a question, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom so we can see you. And you don't have to ask.